Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk, everyone. Today, we are speaking about a very important topic that's going to impact people with kidney disease in 2025. And it goes back to payment and how the dialysis bundle works. And we're going to try to simplify it in 25, 30 minutes, but just enough to be able for you to know what's going on and, and make your voice be heard. Today, we're talking to Dr. Jeffrey Silberswig. Um, he's been a nephrologist since 1995. Dr. Silberswig will be speaking, um, we're going to be speaking about this, and I'm going to let you introduce yourself so you can tell your incredible history, and, and we'll go into the topic. So I, don't, I don't know that my history is incredible, but I did my nephrology training at the University of Pennsylvania, returned to my home in New York City, and joined the Rogerson Institute and Cornell Medical College in 1995. Early in my career, I was a nephrologist in a dialysis center in Queens and spent my, my days uh, hands-on taking care of patients, uh, rounding in the dialysis unit and assessing patients and, and doing my best to meet their needs. Um, after a couple of years, I became medical director of that facility, uh, later became medical director of another of our affiliated dialysis facilities in Manhattan as well as the dialysis centers at uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital's uh, Wild Cornell campus. Um, I'm now the chief medical officer at the Robeson Institute. We run 10 dialysis centers in New York City as a nonprofit dialysis provider. We care for approximately 1,400 patients with end-stage kidney disease. I'm also the medical director of the dialysis units at the Wild Cornell and Lower Manhattan Hospital campuses of New York Presbyterian. I'm a professor of clinical medicine at Wild Cornell Medical College and uh, a leader in the uh, nephrology training program and the internal medicine residency program uh, at Cornell. As you know, Lori, I sit on the Kidney Care Partners, which is a coalition of dialysis providers, patient groups, professional organizations, and manufacturers of products related to, to kidney disease. Um, and uh, as you say, we're here today to talk about uh, the, the inclusion of oral medications uh, in the dialysis bundle payment, um, which is slated to begin in January of 2025. You know, you've been around a long time, and we've both been around a long time. And so we wanted to give the community our perspective on, you know, the importance of bone and mineral management. And it's important for people, um, especially those on dialysis, um, to have it managed correctly. And phosphate-lowering drugs are a really important part of managing that. So can you tell us a little bit about why phosphate-lowering drugs are important? Sure. Um, when the kidneys are functioning normally, uh, they eliminate phosphorus from the body and they regulate the level of calcium uh, in the blood. Uh, as everybody knows, calcium is a major component of bone and to get, together with phosphorus. And when those levels are disordered, patients will, will have an elevation in the level of parathyroid hormone, which is a mineral that maintains calcium levels, but unfortunately at the expense of taking that mineral out of bones. So that patients with chronic kidney disease, we frequently refer to it as chronic kidney disease metabolic bone disorder, or CKD, MBD, um, when patients have that disorder, um, they are at risk for complications like bone fractures. And unfortunately, we also see that the calcium can be deposited in the cardiovascular structures, in the heart and blood vessels, um, and that not surprisingly contributes to the, the cardiovascular problems that many patients with chronic kidney disease have. Yes. I mean, I've I've had several friends that have experienced calcification of their arteries, and it's not a pretty sight. It's a very, very painful condition. And um, 
let's so so patients you know i i took phosphate binders back in when i was eight years old and it was really interesting all the changes i've seen over the years when i was eight i mean i used to take this phosphate um uh, drugs that would i would take it and i'd burp and, and and powder would come out of my mouth um you know so they've evolved over the years um but today currently um just to explain how do patients take these drugs today um because i think it's important i mean we have to take a lot of them. <laughs> yes, you're right. So the most commonly used drugs today um, really fall into two categories. Some of them are calcium-based phosphate binders. Uh, agents that people may be familiar with are calcium acetate or phospho. And uh, non-calcium-based binders, the agents that people may be most familiar with uh, are things like uh, Renvella or Renagel, which is uh, a generic, uh, in generic form is Civelomer. And these are agents that that patients need to take with every meal that they eat and frequently need to take multiple pills with every meal. So I've had patients who need to take as many as four or five uh, pills with each meal. Um, And obviously that becomes a a very significant burden um, for many patients. Right, because we're on a fluid limit is what makes it tough. And um, I know some people that have a hard time swallowing pills. I mean, so to get 15 down a day can be tough um, and emotional, stressful, uh, like, oh, my God, I, you know, I'm, I don't want to eat a lunch because I don't want to take any pills. <laughs> um, uh, you know, those conversations have happened. Sure. And I can imagine that patients also feel full just from having to take that many pills with a meal. So, so they don't end up getting all the nutrition that they need. Right. I mean, it's tough. I mean, I know people can't even take, you know, a full prescription of antibiotics because they get tired. So just think of taking, you know, anywhere from up to 15 pills just with your meals every day. That's why it's so important to have this topic. So in currently right now, and it's very complicated, but we have a bundle system and there's a lot of things that are in the bundle. Uh, you can get an explanation of that um, on our website because they pay for. Uh, can you give us just a quick overview of what the bundle pays for today and, and then how they want to move the phosphate binders in the bundle in 2025? And there's, we're working to try to keep them out of the bundle, and we want to explain why. Sure. So the first dialysis bundle uh, came out around 2011. And there was a payment that would cover the cost for the dialysis treatment. So that was the cost for the machine, the nurses that take care of patients, the overhead, um, meaning the, the rent for the facility and electricity and all of that, as well as facility cleaning. And then there was a separate fee that Medicare paid for the medications that were administered at, at during the dialysis treatment. So that would include things like epigen in those days. It would include the, the vitamin D preparations, um, medications like that. A few years later, Medicare decided that the two bundles was not working efficiently, and they rolled it all into to one payment so that there was a single payment that would cover essentially all of the, the medications that a patient would receive during dialysis as well as the services, the, the machine and the dialyzer and the, the other equipment and staff for the dialysis treatment. The issue that we've seen is that in some cases, dialysis facilities will look at that bundled payment and say that, you know, if, if they use more medication, right, that money comes out of what they might otherwise use to, to pay their staff or, or other costs. And uh, if they use less medications, then they have more money to, to pay for their other costs. You know, what's interesting to me is I hear a lot of people say, like, the original bundle was in the early 70s when, um, you know, Medicare created this special ESRD program. So we're the only illness that has this. So we're really the guinea pigs. So we can tell the good, the bad, and the ugly of everything that happened. And and the way the system is now is I go back to having phosphate binders that, you know, I used to burp and powder would come out of my mouth. And, you know, we've evolved with different types of phosphate binders. The problem with the bundle is that if they go in the bundle, CMS will add a little money. Like right now, they're getting about $270, somewhere around there, give or take, 
per treatment to provide everything, all the staff, all the the building, all the medication, all not all the medication, most of the medication, the treatment, and now they want to roll in the phosphate binders into the payment. So CMS will come up with a number of whatever that is and put it in the bundle. And then that's where we live. That's what, what the drugs we get that they can afford. So let's talk a little bit about why that's problematic. Yeah, so what happens is that whatever amount of money CMS determines um, covers the average cost of, in this case, we're talking about phosphate binders, would then be added to the bundle. Um, And obviously, not every patient is an average patient, so that for some patients, that will be sufficient amount of money. For other patients, it won't, whereas in an ideal situation, a patient together with their physician would determine which medication is best for them to take to control their phosphorus level and to provide the least side effects. In this case, that choice might be limited by what's covered in the bundle. So that if there's not enough money to cover the newer, innovative, more expensive medications, some patients may not have that medication available to them. Well, and you know, it, it's it's interesting to me because it's like people with kidney disease, um, I, and I've seen it over the years, we need hope. And, and when I was 18 years old, I had a second transplant, and I was told I would never get another kidney, and I'd live the rest of life on, my di- on dialysis. But innovation evolved, and I got the third, and you know what I mean? Like, I got the care because innovation was part of the equation. And what I'm fearful in this is that this will be the dead end for medication being developed to help control bone and mineral disease with the biggest culprit, which is phosphorus. That's my biggest fear by putting them in the bundle. We won't be given a choice. And if the doctor and patient decide there's a newer drug that's better, but in quite quite all frankness, there won't be any new drugs. <laughs> <laughs> um, if this happens. And that's what fear scares me even more because people aren't going to innovate and create new medication if they don't have a payment path. So it's a very complicated issue, but we have to decide as a society if we want to just stay where we are or do we want to innovate and provide the best care for people. I mean, that's really the question. And And your point is incredibly well taken. You know, as you said before, if if we go back to the days of the very old phosphate binders, they were medications that were intolerable. E- even in the older days that I remember, I remember using aluminum as a as a phosphate binder, and it came in in both liquid and tablet forms. Um, but that aluminum got absorbed; it uh, was was incorporated into bone, um, and it caused dementia for a lot of patients. So it was a poor solution. Um, it was inexpensive, so that part of it was good but it really caused some very severe side effects. And we certainly don't want to go back to the days of when that was our our best choice for a phosphate binder. So you're right, innovation is incredibly important. And, you know, when we talk to the manufacturers, um, they tell us that the way that the bundle is structured without enough money to pay for these new innovative products that, that are available today and may come down the line, their incentive for innovating in the kidney space is very limited. And so that deprives kidney patients of the innovation that they should have in the same way that patients with other conditions get innovation. Right. You've heard me say it forever that the 90s, I sold a product that I know for sure benefits patients. And it was limited because it wasn't, it was a medical device that wasn't paid for in the bundle. So it didn't get adopted. And so I've seen this happen. And once something goes in the bundle, how CMS measures quality is to see if the provider is managing the patients appropriately. That's that's the way they do it. There isn't any measure that, and I don't believe there ever will be a measure that the community would agree upon that could be effective to help ensure that the patients are getting the right care. 
in my opinion, I just don't think there's going to be consensus in the medical community because it's a medical practice and everybody has their own opinion. And we just can't seem to come to a number. And if we do, in my opinion, it's just usually the bare minimum. It's the floor. The quality is the floor. And I want to pursue optimal care as a person with kidney disease, not just the bare minimum. That's been my goal as, as a patient for, for my entire life. Um, and I'm sure that's the physician's goal. <laughs> you know, absolutely. Uh, all physicians would like to provide optimal care to their patients. And you're right, there's not a way to measure optimal care directly. Um, but that said, there are ways to measure uh, the quality of care that patients receive. And, you know, the, the quality incentive program in dialysis was built to be a rudimentary measure of the quality of care being delivered. Um, there is the ICH CAPS score, which is a, a score that lets patients express their opinions of the, of the care they're receiving in dialysis centers. So those are steps in the right direction. Um, they're, they're imperfect for sure, but they're at least steps towards measuring the quality of care that patients receive. And I think that this is an area where patients need to be well-informed. They need to understand what these measures are and how they work and, and what role they can have in getting better or worse uh, quality from those measurements. I'm a big believer that I have been very lucky over my lifetime of having just a few doctors that took care of me and that continuity of care and how we sit down and, and talk about what's best for us is the most important part of healthcare. We can't interfere with the patient-doctor relationship. Um, and I think also it, you know, we have a healthcare shortage of doctors in this community. I don't think it helps that situation when you take some of these choices away from doctors to be able to prescribe. You know, they can't prescribe a drug if it's not paid for. I mean, that's really the name of the game, right? Absolutely. And and we've talked about some of the, the newer medications, and this is getting a little off topic. Like, um, but some of the medications that have, have been used, like one that recently came out to, to treat itching in, in patients receiving dialysis, which is a, it seems to be a very effective drug, but because of the payment structure for it, very few patients have been able to get it, and doctors are very frustrated by the fact that they can't prescribe it for all the patients they think might benefit from it. Well, and I loved one of the comments by one of the physicians, like, I don't even want to think about giving a patient new drug if I have to take it away from them. That causes a conflict. Sure. And and I'm like, it's true. You know, you don't want to like, hey, this works. I don't, I mean, and I have to say, like, I just was bit by a bunch of those ankle biter mosquitoes. They ate me up over the weekend. <laughs> I mean, I had like a new, I mean, I had ice packs on me last night trying to sleep. And I'm like, people like, you know, it's a different subject than this, but I mean, itching is a horrible symptom. And it's, we're healthcare. We're, it's a healthcare. We're supposed to be helping us feel better. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, what's the purpose if we can't help people feel better with their symptoms? That's what we, that's what healthcare is about. Or find a Absolutely. cure. They help them with their symptoms or they find a cure. Those are the two options, in my opinion, as a patient. You know, to get, you're absolutely right. And, and I'm like, we're taking away taking care of the symptoms. So if a medication is making me sick to my stomach from phosphate binders and I get it prescribed, you know, if it's in the bundle, um, let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, this will be new. The, the dialysis units are going to be dispensing this medication because it's now not going to come through. Uh, Medicare Part D is going to come through Medicare Part B. So I imagine the provider is going to hand you a bag of medication every month. Is that how it will work? Well, you know, honestly, that's something that providers are still working out. Many, particularly smaller providers who don't have pharmacies in their, in their companies are still figuring out how best to do it. Some have talked about potentially having a card that a patient would get that they would be able to go to their local pharmacy and pick up their medication in the pharmacy the same way you might today with a Medicare Part D card um, go to your, your pharmacy and, and get your medication. Others have talked about contracting with uh, pharmacies that would then 
deliver the medication to the dialysis facility prepackaged with an individual patient's name on it, and the patient would then receive that medication from the nurse. So, so there's still some factors to be worked out. Right. I mean, all I envision is the nurse hands the prescription bag to the patient during dialysis, and they leave it somewhere. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, right. like, like, you know, you're tired and you're leaving. And then I, and, and I guess they're going to give a whole month supply, right? Like it's going to be not just a week or two, correct? I mean, maybe they haven't even figured that out. Well, that's, that's the plan that I've heard is that it would be a month supply at a time. But your point is very well taken. If a patient, you know, isn't feeling well and leaves the medication in the dialysis unit or on the whatever their transportation home is, you know, then then what happens? They have to get another month's supply. And if they have a, a copay, you know, presumably they would have to pay part of it. Um, and the dialysis facility would have to pay part of it. And for everybody in this system, that then means that medication that or money rather that could be used to treat a patient isn't going towards treating anybody. Right. And so it, it builds a very wasteful system. Well, and also, I've been prescribed a phosphate binder, and a week later, I have such serious GI issues that I need another one. So I'm like, how? I mean, I'm just used to running to my Walgreens, okay? <laughs> I mean, I mean right. that's, that's what my doctor, I call my doctor, let me order you something else. I mean, I see that at risk. It's very much at risk. Because it's like we don't have enough dialysis staff as it is either. We have a, a healthcare shortage, and we're dumping something else on them to do. Um, I, it just makes no sense to me. And then who's going to talk to the patient? Like, you know, I get kind of bored of hearing the pharmacist say this, but do you have any questions for me about this drug you've been taking for 30 years? <laughs> and I'm like, no, but thank you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But at least well, I'm but, asked the question. And, and it's one thing if it's medication that you've been taking for 30 years. But if it's a new medication, either because you didn't tolerate one well or because there's an innovative medication, you know, it's important that you have at least the option of being able to talk with someone who can tell you about medication interactions or, or various other issues that you might face and, and make you aware because, you know, frequently I get asked by patients, you know, I've tried this medication that you prescribed and, you know, I had a, a fever or I had a headache or whatever. And they want to know if that's related. But if the pharmacist has, if you have the opportunity to sit with a pharmacist before you start that medication, the pharmacist can warn you about what are common side effects. And it prepares you as a patient better so that when things happen or don't happen, you know what to expect. Right. No, and I mean, because people go to Facebook and ask the other patients, you know, like, oh, I, you know, I mean, they do. And it's, it's not always a good outcome because... People shouldn't give advice to the other patients. You know, there's a bit another argument that's been out there that I just want to talk a minute about. And it's like currently phosphate lowering agents are in Medicare Part D. And so when you're in Medicare Part D, you can have a, a copay. I mean, uh, there used to be a donut, but I hear the donuts going away. So they're like, well, patients won't have copays like they do within Medicare Part D. And I have to say, I'm frustrated by that argument because innovation and the right drug is more important than just getting the least expensive drug. That has always, I mean, that's why I'm here after, you know, 50 years of this illness since I was two years old, that I've been able to get the drug that's right for me with my physician. And I would rather have the right drug with a physician's blessing to be the best one if I have a little higher copay than to just say, oh, I would just rather not have a payment. And that's the whole craziness of Medicare Advantage. Like, well, the patients won't have any other copays. Well, we could create a whole other show on the problems with managed care. So you get what you pay for. And, and I'm such a believer in that in leaving the choice to the patient and the physician. Managed care, value-based care, whatever you want to say about it is, you know, you don't get continuity of care. I mean, we could do a whole, a whole list of problems that people are experiencing with that that are well known. So I see this very similar. So we must go for quality instead of, oh, the patient saves a few bucks because we pay for it on the other end of our life. I mean, there's a saying with many of us old timers, like, you know, we're dealing, I mean, I've had, 
I'm the queen of parts for having to live with bone and mineral disease my whole life. You know, if I knew I was going to live this long, um, I'm going to say, it, I wish I would have had a ba- access to better medication. Or, you know what I mean? Like, like you don't realize we live a long time with this illness. And phosphorus and bone and mineral management is crucial to us having a quality of life. I, I don't know what else to say. I'm, I'm very passionate about this. And I'm, I'm, I'm just frustrated that we're going down the wrong path. Well, and I, I think the key to what you've said is really that it is a patient's choice. Over the years, I've had many patients say to me, you know, can you find me a less expensive drug because the copay is high for a drug? And other times I've had patients say to me, I want the best drug. I don't care if it costs me a little more. But that should really be a patient's choice. It shouldn't be a choice that's made by CMS or, or by, you know, whoever, whatever other insurer um, a patient is working th- with through a, a Medicare Advantage plan. And I worry, as you say, that the inclusion of oral phosphate binding drugs or phosphate lowering medications um, in the bundle will eliminate patient choice. And I think that that's a, a bad mistake. Well, and it also signals that we don't really think you need innovation. Uh, I, I mean, because there are going to be no innovators that are going to come in the space based on the last history of what happened to the the itching medication. I mean, um, I think what it was, they put so much in the bundle originally, and it would take, um, at the time, it was like 1,500 patients to be able to give it to one. I think they increased it a little bit, but if I do the calculations right, you had to have like 700 patients not taking it to give it to one. I mean, the numbers are crazy. Like, I just don't understand how this can be a good way to move forward if we want to provide quality care to people with kidney disease because the doctor must be our advocate. Our nephrologist is the patient's advocate. And this is, they partner together what's best for them. And payment being in the way of allowing what's right for the patient's treatment um, is, is, in my opinion, disaster. I, I agree with you. You know, and the reality is, is that in some managed care organizations, I mean, patients have told me, they get the cheapest drug till it fails. And I'm like, what's the definition of fail with phosphate binders? Because it's not something like your blood pressure that reacts immediately. We'll start itching more, and, you know, nobody's really caring about that. <laughs> um, and, you know, we may have some symptoms, but we don't feel the long-term side effects of if this is wrong until it's too late. That's what people don't understand. And when I heard, like, oh, we'll give, um, we give the cheapest medication, it was a Medicare, Medicare Advantage plan, until it fails. I'm asking you as a physician, what is the definition of fail? Yeah, and I, I, you know, obviously there's not a single answer to that because what success or failure is is often different for every patient. Um, a medication may be effective in this case at lowering your phosphorus level, but if you're not tolerating it well, having GI side effects or, or you know, losing your appetite from it, then it fails. Right. You know, and and similarly, if it's not able to control your phosphorus level, then it fails. But as you say, phosphorus levels are frequently measured only once a month so that the, the patient and the provider may not know that for, for weeks after a patient started a medication. And I've even seen times where, you know, a, a provider or, or an insurer will say to a patient, you know, well, your level's a little high this month, but let's continue on it a little longer to see if maybe it kicks in. Right. And, you know, as you said before, that could lead to long-term damage. Well, and that's, I mean, there's just so many unknowns. That's what's really scary. Um, And we're going in uncharted territory. We're the first illness to go through this, I mean, process, um, disease bait. So we're kind of the guinea pigs. And it's not easy to change a policy. So there is a bill out right now, um, Kidney Patient Act, H.R. 5074, and it's designed to not have the orals go in the bundle in 2025. And I'm in support of that bill because of, of our just past 30 minutes together. <laughs> and and I'd like to, you know, I'd love to hear from people, but I, I feel very strongly about this. And 
you know, I feel like we're going down the wrong path and we need to figure out, I mean, as a whole, the bundled payment system is got some great um, parts of it. I'm, I'm a survivor of, of kidney disease since it was started in the early 70s and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but there's side effects to us. Um, and I want people to be aware because we're going to be reliant on the kidney community for the rest of our lives. We're either going to have a transplant or on dialysis. And so we need to make sure that the payment drives the best care. And, and I think you're right. And the only way that, that patients can advocate for themselves is by reading about these things, talking to, to informed patients like yourself, um, and getting a good understanding of what the pros and cons of legislation like the, the legislation that you refer to are so that they can then reach out to their representatives in Congress and in the Senate and and express their opinion about a bill like this and the impact that it might have on them. And, you know, before we wrap up, I, I want to bring up one comment that I've heard quite a bit. Medicare doesn't have enough money, so they're making a lot of these choices. They're, they're cutting, they just cut the physician payment. Um, am I correct? Yes. I mean, that's, the big issue right there is like nobody wants to increase the Medicare budget because it's a lot of people are on it now that we're giving more people health care. That's the reality of it. I, I saw it when the Affordable Care Act came into place. I saw people who never would seek care went and got care for the first time, which, you know, people didn't even want to go get a kidney disease diagnosis because they didn't want it on their record. <laughs> Um, you know, they knew they had kidney disease, but they're like, I don't want to go to a doctor because, I mean, I won't ever get insurance again. I'll have a pre-existing condition. And that's a reality of our flawed system. So when we did, you know, no pre-existing conditions, you know, people flocked to get health care and to get care. And um, a lot of them ended up on Medicare through different different entities. So I think that we need to be aware of the shift of people we've had. And, you know, eventually I'm hopeful that, um, you know, we'll get a little better in the future. But, you know, this is all due to budget. It's not patient-centered. It's like all budget. And I want people to be aware of that, that we need to have a different discussion because we can't go backwards. I mean, we have a physician shortage and you just cut their pay by three and a half percent. I don't think that's going to attract people. <laughs> So people are going to get, you know, not have access to a doctor and end up at the emergency room because they couldn't get an appointment. I mean, it's like penny wise and pound foolish. I, I think you're right. You know, and, and you're right that it becomes a budgetary choice. And I think we all understand that the federal government has a large deficit and they need to find ways to, to reduce spending. But to reduce spending so that it risks patients' health, um, I think is a, a very dangerous approach. And so I think patients really need to understand the impact that the budgetary discussions that are taking place right now in Washington, D.C. may potentially have on them um, and, and get involved and, and get educated so that they can speak for themselves. Exactly. And RSN has a, a section on our website called Champions of Kidney Care. Um, we have a lot of information on who to find out who is your congressman, who is, um, there's a whole kidney caucus member. Your, see if your member is one of, a member of the kidney caucus. That means they are more interested in kidney disease. The other ones may not know anything about kidney disease, so you might have to go educate them. But it's really important that everybody get engaged, involved, and learn about it. There is no silver bullet. I mean, this is a complicated issue. And, um, you know, just trying to help people understand that um, you got to be proactive. We can't be reactive because after something's done, it's really hard to undo it. <laughs> and so we need to, to speak up and say exactly what that statement you said is that you know, we need to save money, but not at the expense of the patient. And and that's that's what's being lost here, that conversation. And, and Congress people, when they hear from patients and hear how patients are affected by the decisions that they make, that really motivates them to act. So as you said, if, if the people listening to this call can get involved, even if it's just writing a letter or an email or or you know, making a phone call to their, their representative's office 
that has a lot of impact. And patients should never be resigned to accept what the, the current existing process is. They should always believe that they can do better. And we're here to support and help in any way that we can. Well, you know what? I mean, I you couldn't have said it better. And I, I appreciate your advocacy and speaking up. And, you know, people, we all need to learn and have discussions and try to get the best system because, you know, I, I'm not getting out of the system alive. <laughs> and so it's really important that we advocate. And it's really hard, I know, when you don't feel well or you're trying to figure out all your new care plan uh, it's very simple on our website, and um, just start with baby steps. And then, in in many years, it may you may become an advocate and be a regular uh, player in, in Congress, like going around and talking to people and and being educated about it. Because that's what we need. They need to hear from more people with the illness. But this stuff is complicated, and and so we try to simplify it at RSN so you can make your own decision what you think is right. I was just going to say, I think that's the key is that patients need to be active. And if they don't feel strong enough to speak for themselves, have their friends or their family speak for them, but they need to be informed and they need to to get involved um, to protect themselves. And this applies to every aspect of public policy. If you were good on the environment or you're good on, you know, trash, cl- I mean, whatever the issue is, you have to be informed and we have to tell elected officials what we need. They are our lobbyists. Absolutely. Um, and they are the patients, they are the community's lobbyists. And we got to do our job to inform them of what they need to do. So I always tell them they work for us. Congress works for us, people. Remember that. Absolutely. And we need to hold them accountable. So thank you so much for your time and uh, and your dedication, and I look forward to seeing you in the next meeting. My pleasure. I look forward to it as well. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.